and welcome to a vital episode of Ben's Junk. Not that it's ever lacking in vitality. But uh, yeah, this one is actually kind of crucial within the behind-the-scenes realm of Oddity Archive. So I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that the whole reason that the final episode of my little History of VHS subseries has been on indefinite hold was because I wanted to devote the heart of that episode to the DVHS, or Digital VHS and or D-Theater, format. And that I wasn't having much luck in capturing footage for the episode. It's kind of important. Well, it's only taken me the best part of a year, but I think I've finally gotten myself into a position where the episode can finally be, for one, written, but uh, more importantly, made. So with that, today, let's take a look at the device that finally pulled my history of VHS out of the mud. This is the Cloner Alliance Box Pro. And uh, yeah, I am probably the hundredth person to do a video on this, but nonetheless, I will do my best to add some kind of original insight into it, uh, particularly from the perspective of someone who deals almost entirely in older media. But uh, there is a lot to discuss here. This is going to be a very talky video, so let's just dive right in. Funnily enough, this appears to be, as of my making this, Cloner Alliance's bottom-of-the-line capture device. Now, it's not the fact that I'm a total cheapskate that got me to pick this thing up, but it's the fact that it's the only device I've seen out there lately that not only passes stuff via HDMI, but more importantly to me, component video, and as a nice bonus, composite and VGA computer graphics. Uh, for whatever reason, it appears that Cloner Alliance has just not carried all the legacy stuff to their newer, shinier gear. Now, of course, that's not to say that I wouldn't love the ability to pass and capture 4K at 60 frames per second via HDMI, but let's face it, Oddity Archive is 99% about legacy media. And speaking of legacy stuff, all that on this unit is covered by the MMI input, which we'll see a little later. But this input uses a breakout cable, so it's HDMI on one end, and it breaks out to, and hopefully my camera will focus, VGA, composite, <laughs> if kind of blurry, and, of course, what I was really after, component. Now, having said that, uh, there is no S-Video support, which I kind of expected. It's kind of redundant now. And uh, there's no coax support. And that's not really a problem, because there's lots of ways around that. Uh, I can get around S-Video, too. But uh, yeah, I, I should note that uh, there is a, a bit of a quirk on the audio front, though. So it will reduce all audio to effectively plain stereo. So a true, for example, Dolby Digital soundtrack won't carry over per se, but it'll give you a, for lack of a better term, a fold down of it. But at the same time, I haven't run it through a, my home theater setup but it doesn't sound like anything uh, important is missing. And if I were to run it through my home theater setup, I'd imagine that the rear info would still be there to some degree. So let's just take a quick spin around the unit itself. So hopefully my autofocus holds out. On the front, we've got a series of three buttons. So on the left, we've got the source button to switch between HDMI and so on. In the center, we've got a snapshot button to take stills, and I don't see a practical use for that, but it works. And on the right, we've got a dual record start stop button. That should be plenty self-explanatory. Now on the side here, we've got a series of three eighth inch jacks. And so we've got uh, left and center line in and outputs, and on the right, a mic input. 
And I'm no expert, but I'm guessing this is for gamers who are trying to not only capture game footage, but add their own commentary and possibly some third-party audio to it. Admittedly, I have not tested this because I personally just have no reason to. But anyway, on the right, we've got the USB port, and that's where you hook up a flash drive or an external hard drive. But just note that unless you don't mind your footage getting split into two gigabyte chunks uh, with a quarter to half a second of missing footage between files, you're going to want to run on NTFS formatted drives, meaning that you're going to need a Windows computer if you want to, you know, drop the files onto a computer. But uh, I've actually got more to say about the computer stuff, but if I do it now, I'll get way off track. So anyway, on the back... Starting from the left, we've got the spot for the power supply, and then we've got HDMI in and outputs, and between those is the aforementioned MMI input for that breakout cable. And lastly, nice and tiny off to the right, we've got a micro USB port to connect to your, again, ideally Windows computer. And, uh, yeah, now let me unload my computer rant. So this thing comes bundled with two pieces of software. One is a basic MP4 editor program that lets you stitch the, if you choose, two gigabyte files back together and also has some basic editing stuff and it has uh, some DVD burning software in there. But the other and main piece of software lets your computer act as the final destination for your footage, as opposed to a flash drive or whatever. Now, my main Windows rig is a laptop that dual boots Windows 7 and 10. I could not get the driver to work under Windows 7, in spite of the fact that Cloner Alliance says it's still supported. So I was able to get it to work under Windows 10, albeit after some fidgeting and trial and error, but in the process, it managed to mangle something on my hard drive, and I wound up having, by force, to do three rounds of that Windows You May Have a Damaged Hard Drive dance with the white text on the black background, and sometimes it scrolls really fast. But anyway, uh, as I said, I did get it to work on Windows 10, and my laptop hasn't choked again, knock on wood. And so uh, I guess the bottom line is, with regards to that software... Install at your own risk. So another downer about this is that it hits some of the potholes of cheap Chinese junk. So for one, there is some definite English going on in both the on-screen menu and in the manual, and some extraneous spaces and just kind of weird errors. But uh, there's also a bug for first-time users that apparently everybody gets and almost every time will get you an error message that doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, when you try and boot the device. And I'm not entirely sure what I did to make it go away, but it seemed to start working for me on the third try. But it's been reliable since then, so knock on wood. And also, the remote has a definite cheap Chinese vibe to it. See the sloppily placed sticker there? But anyway, the remote is mostly self-explanatory, although uh, you gotta love that really cheap-looking text. But uh, yeah, there are quirks even to the remote. So for a quick example, if you want to play an existing file, you hit the playback button and you'll go through the menu to find your file, and you'll hit the play pause button below it. See, in my mind, that should all be one button. But uh, yeah, you have to pay attention to that. And also, if you're not quick on the draw, like within two or three seconds, the device itself will go into a preview mode where it'll start playing the file, but in kind of a thumbnail size. So, And also things kind of slow down in terms of responsiveness when that happens, at least for me. And this is also one of those deals where you have to be aiming right at the device. Um, the remote sensor range is just horrible. And uh, let's see what else here. You'll want to keep an eye on the resolution settings. So I'm looking at the bottom row of buttons there. 
Now, sometimes, actually a fair amount of the time, it'll just choose for you initially. So, yeah, you may have a VCR hooked up and it'll default to 480 interlaced, but maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you want 1080p and you want to record in that anyway. I'm very guilty of that. So you do have to keep an eye on it. Okay, last point of business before we get to my quite lengthy run of test footage. For all its quirks, this device has handled every last thing I've thrown at it like a champ. From my cheapest, crappiest VHS deck and my worst tapes on up to 4K Blu-ray, it has passed everything beautifully. And best of all, with no significant sync issues or major dropouts, uh, I think I'm still going to have to use an external time-based corrector for some of the tape stuff. But uh, I am going to guess that there's some sort of software-based time-based corrector in here already. Now, having said that, if you get one of these, make sure you stay on the lowest compression setting you can. While the video seems to hold up okay to extra compression, the audio gets pretty lossy pretty quickly. I found myself having to redo a good chunk of my footage because I was just a little slow to pick up on this fact. And uh, also for whatever reason, regardless of whatever setting I use, this, at least in my own experience, will only create widescreen files. And there is supposed to be one setting on here where you can do native 4x3. I guess it's one of the ones where you have it hooked to the PC, but it hasn't worked for me. But uh, it's really not an issue. So you can still do 4x3 material just fine. It just gets pillar boxed. So, you know, the black bars on the left and right parts of the screen. But I've been able to dump that footage into handbrake and chop off the dead space there and... Everything seems to come out perfectly intact, uh, no new artifacting or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I think that kind of is the perfect metaphor for all this. It ain't perfect, it's quirky, uh, it's not even going to completely replace my usual camcorder-based method of transfers, but it's good. And for me, it opens the door to some new outputs that I either hadn't had before or only had truly inferior transfer methods. So uh, with that, I am going to leave you with a nice long run of test footage, which I may have to break parts of it up with text because I do have a fair amount to say at times. But uh, otherwise, that is it for me on the vocal front for today. I guess I now need to get to work on finishing the history of VHS, don't I? Good evening, and welcome to a private showing of three paintings. Anything more you need, Mr. Hendricks? Please listen carefully to a very special TV offer from National Shop at Home Service. How would you like to treat yourself to the most heavenly sleeping experience of your life? Dream Bed is actually an inflatable mattress. Folded, it's the size of a hat box. Weight only 12 pounds, easily stored on a closet shelf. Inflated, it's a luxurious portable bed that turns any room into a bedroom in just minutes. And it inflates so easily you don't even need an air pump. <laughs> By special arrangement with Viacom International, Magnetic Video Corporation is proud to offer the following major motion picture on video cassettes. Music was always a heavy part of the uh, whole thing. Let's clean up America with my tough and ready, the one paper towel that works twice as hard. Look, 
Put a leading towel and tough and ready against a dried on mess, and it's my tough and ready that has the strength. Neat cutlass, Harry. With all this cutlass economy and old's value, no wonder cutlass is America's best selling mid size. Share a new cutlass. Oh, Harry. Happy anniversary. We had one built for, for you, honey. For us. So once you do get through, it is vital that you make an impression that will separate you from all the rest. Basically, an AR person is the person who is looking out for the talent that exists within the label, number one. Created by Elizabeth Howard and Howard Austin. Can we get a level on the tracks, please? Great. Let's go from the top. Pleased to bring you our feature presentation. VHS has evolved digitally, a high-definition video format that far surpasses standard TV images has now arrived. DVHS, the video format that allows high-definition images to be digitally recorded and played back in the age of digital television. Because now there is a new pre-recorded software platform that takes maximum advantage of the superior characteristics of DVHS. It's called D-Theater. Reverse course immediately or we will begin to fire. Well, that's it for today's archive. Join us next time when I unleash a serious pop quiz on your asses on the differences between EIA and SMPTE. Strawberry Belgian waffle platter, fresh strawberry pancake platter, and more. Then keep things sweet with pies and fresh baked favorites from Perkins Bakery. <laughs> strawberry Belgian waffle platter, fresh strawberry pancake platter, and more. Then keep things sweet with pies and fresh baked favorites from Perkins Bakery. Perfect for the kids, because they can kind of make it their own. So what I'm going to start with is I'm just going to layer a few of our
cubes of the angel food cake in the bottom of this trifle dish. And there's no particular way that you have to do this. your house and keep bugs out. It's a breeze with America's favorite hands-free screen door with over 10 million sold. Stop struggling with sliders. Walk easily through any doorway. CEO of the Development Foundation, Bob Munt, thank you for joining us for Inside Town Hall. First off, let's talk a little bit about what is the Development Foundation. So the Development Foundation was started many years ago by business leaders, truly as a nonprofit. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply sorry, Stan. Okay, bye-bye. Oh, man. Oh, your friend, little kid? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I was, I was just waiting for you. Okay. Nice car. Why are you pulling? Oh, no, just, you know, none of my friends have a car this nice. Why you bring me here? Well, what do you mean? Seem partner. spoken a word in 15 years. The compassion's overwhelming, Doctor. 